This presentation is Pirates, Liars, and Thieves, or Homage, Copyright, and Appropriation. So this quote is from a book that I do recommend on how to steal like an artist. So this is a statement on stealing. And what I would recommend is that one, when stealing should be more clever than Prometheus. If you see the image on the right, this is Prometheus who stole fire. And as a result, he was punished by the gods and he was tortured by having his liver eaten every day, I believe. So the quote goes, nothing is original, steal from everywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, books, music, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you like it. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Godard said, it's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. This quote is attributed to Jim Jarmusch. So we live in a culture that is so layered with attribution, it is all going to someone somewhere uh, just think about the act of looking at your Instagram. We are inundated in our society with images everywhere. So the term appropriationism reflects the overproduction of reproductions, remakings, reenactments, recreations, revisionings, reconstructions by copying, imitating, repeating, quoting, plagiarizing, simulating, adapting pre-existing names, concepts, and forms. In fact, Pretty much all of this presentation is taken from somewhere else and it contains almost nothing original whatsoever. So appropriationism is discussed in comparison um, of appropriation forms and concepts of the 20th century, which offer new representations of established knowledge as a kind of racing standstill, referring to the acceleration of random uncontrollable operations and highly mobilized fluid Western societies that are governed more and more by abstract forms of control. Unlimited access to digital archive of creations and easily feasible digital technologies, as well as the priority of fresh ideas and creative processes over a perfect masterpiece leads to hyperactive hustle and bustle around the past instead of launching new expeditions into unexplored territory that could give visibility to the forgotten ghosts and ignored phantoms of our common myths and ideologies. Here is an image of one of the amazing Fred Tomaselli's works. His pieces are made of pieces. This collage work is incredibly meta. So while you see a figure standing before you surrounded by a deep space of butterflies, as we zoom in and look closer, the eyes are made of eyes, the ears are made of ears, the noses are made of noses, the mouths are made of mouths. And when we get close to that hand, you see that the arm itself is made of hands and exploding into an expression of flowers. So with this, I'm pairing another quote from How to Steal Like an Artist. He looked on everything as imitation. The most original writers, he said, borrowed from one another. Boyard O has imitated Pulci and Ariofio Boyardo. The instruction we find in books is like fire. We fetch it from our neighbor, kindle it at home, communicate it to others as it becomes property for all. So this is from the historical, the historical memoirs and life and writings of Voltaire. So it is said that at this point um, in our society by Boudrillard, that we live in a simulacra or in a simulacrum. And this would be 
how we are in inundated and surrounded by images that are representations and insubstantial or superficial likeness or semblance. So one of way to express this is art may imitate life, but life imitates TV. So what is reality when everything is a copy of a copy of a copy? And then in that, what is originality? Originality is the aspect of created works as being new or novel, thus distinguishable from reproductions, forgeries, copies, clones, or derivative. They possess unique style and substance. The increasing attention to plagiarism is largely response, a response to the cult of originality, first shaped by the romantics, those who venerated individual genius, and further in this intensified by the 21st century. So the market economy values novelty in its expressive works. We carve out exceptions for writers like Shakespeare, a plagiarist by modern day standards, because they are creative in their use of borrowed material. Such copyright, I'm sorry, such copying isn't slavish, but inventive. Or as Posner puts it, the imitation is producing value. Those who don't recontextualize borrowed work we censure. So originality, it would appear um, there are progenitors that bring something entirely new in, but then we make exceptions for those who steal well. So what is appropriation? This is the taking of something as private property, a making one's own. So this noun of action is taking, making something one's own. It doesn't really suggest that you've done something bad. You've just made it yours. The most famous instance of appropriation would be Duchamp's R. Mutt, The Urinal from 1917. As a woman, I must admit, I've looked at this many times and was unable to totally realize that this round dark part is actually where the pipe for the water would have affixed and where the perforated holes are in the bottom is where the urine would go out. So he signed the top of it. For me as a woman, this was just very disorienting. I knew it was a urinal, but I couldn't make sense of it. Also, uh, <clears throat> you can pee into anything. So I wasn't aware of its original intent. So appropriation, is art, um, I'm sorry, appropriation art is the use of pre-existing objects or images with little or no transformation applied to them. But as I just suggested, this was merely something that was on the wall placed on the ground and it does have a disorienting effect. And by signing it, therefore it's art. So the use of appropriation has played a significant role in the history of the arts, literature, visual and music uh, and performing arts. In the visual arts, to appropriate means to properly adopt, borrow, recycle, or sample aspects or the entire form of human-made visual culture. Notable in this respect are the ready-mades, again, Marcel Duchamp, inherent in our understanding of appropriation is the concept that new work recontextualizes whatever it borrows to create something new. The most cases in most cases, the original thing remains accessible in the original form without change. So again, to take the urinal that was on the wall, something that one would urinate into, and then place it on the ground, sign it, and look at it formally as an art object, recontextualizes this enough for it to be appropriated art. The next example I would like to share with you in the early 2000s, the Chapman brothers bought and defaced Goya's Disasters of War, a series of prints that reflected the atrocities that were happening in Spain during the revolution. So this would be a seemingly mad act of vandalism. Here you can see the printmaking on the right, and then they drew little faces, kind of grotesque, cartoon-like faces over the Goya print. 
I am going to switch out into this so we can hear this in their own words. If it is still up, we'll see. I do not any longer think that's available, so we'll go back. Okay. So the next artist I would like to share with you is Glenn Brown, one of my favorite artists of the 21st century. He is known for appropriation, which means again, to adopt, borrow, or recycle. So here what you see on the right is a painting by Velasquez of a Pope, and what you see on the left is the Glenn Brown. The Glenn Brown is upside down and painted in a very visceral, almost psychedelic manner with arbitrary color. You might also recognize this image because it was utilized by Francis Bacon. Here is another Glenn Brown, Stardust from 2009. Brown claims that to make something up from scratch is nonsensical. Images are a language. It's impossible to make a painting that is not borrowed. Even the images in your dreams refer to reality. So the painting, you know, who is he copying? This would be a Fragonard-like image or a French Rococo. Another artist who quotes liberally from art history, and I would put in the category of homage, is Kahinde Wiling. This act of appropriation reveals issues about the tradition of portraiture and all that it implies about power and privilege. Wiley asks us to think about the biases in art historical canon, the set of works that are regarded as masterpieces, representation in pop culture, and issues of race and gender. So the piece on the left showing a heroic Napoleon upon you know, a horse rearing up, and the piece on the right showing a contemporary African-American male with an ornate background. It's been written about that the ornament in the background <clears throat> imitates uh, phallic-like structures as well as female floral. And he sought through his works to elevate the everyday male that is not represented in the canon of Western culture. So this is really a heroic act where he is elevating the common man into something comparable to Napoleon. In this slide, what I have shown is just something I've gathered from Wikipedia. This is a list of just a few artists working contemporarily that use appropriation. So notable among these names would be Banksy, Glenn Brown, as I mentioned, um, as well as Max Ernst. He worked from collage images. Marcel Duchamp, again, who made the Fountain or Our Mutt, Marlene Dumas, Shepard Ferry, Vincent van Gogh. He utilized images from uh, Asian art or from Japanese prints, Leon Golub, as well as Damien Hirst, Jasper Johns, Mike Kelly, Jeff Koons, who we'll be speaking about in a moment. This is the work of a naive artist. Um, other words for this would be vernacular art or outsider art. We can hardly have this anymore, even though we are inundated with art and images and the ability to take from all types of artistic environments and make new art. Uh, Henry Darger, we believe, did not know he was an artist. He never exhibited during his own lifetime. He was a janitor, and when he passed away, the people who owned the building went to clean out his space and found thousands and thousands of obsessive images that would use tracing paper over children's books and create an entire mythology of an army of girls that generally had penises or no sex at all, and their war that would play out on the pages. So this work was appropriating from children's literature and creating novel narratives. So one of the most important court cases to have ever occurred about the use of images goes back to Shepard Ferry and his use of this image of Obama that was utilized in the election. So 
In January 2009, after Obama had won the election, Shepard Ferry's mixed media stenciled portrait version of the image was acquired by the Smithsonian Institute and the National Portrait Gallery because it played such an important role in the election. You'll notice this iconic turned up chin and looking out that represents hope was also an allusion to images of um, JFK as well as Lincoln. So this became very controversial, however, in June of 2006, it turns out the Associated Press freelance photographer, Manny Garcia, took this picture. In response to claims by the Associated Press for compensation, Barry sued for a declaratory judgment that his poster was fair use and not using uh, an original photograph that should have been protected. So in the end, the party settled out of court, but this was a big deal that took two years. And in truth, he was supposed to come speak at FSU. We had many conversations, and then at some point on the phone, he said, we're expecting a baby and I'm going to court. And no longer was he coming to FSU. So this original poster, was commissioned and it was with consent that he used Obama's likeness and it was released just before Super Tuesday. And in many ways, for any of us that were paying attention during that time period, this really galvanized the public around the image. It was an incredible act of propaganda. And Obama went from being an almost, you know, an underdog, an obscure person, uh, someone who seemed foreign to being the populist choice, the right choice, and someone who represented the people. And it was all behind Shepard Ferry's work. So this was supposed to represent power and sincerity. So Ferry started silk screening posters and thousands of these went out. The majority of them were really to raise money for the campaign. He wasn't really financially compensated by this, but I absolutely can uh, confirm that in this process, he was blowing up. So he was a counterculture hero. He was part of the lowbrow scene. He was part of the graffiti scene. And then suddenly there went Shep. Shep became blue chip, important artist that superseded everybody around him. He was incendiary. So even though the origin of his work, I first saw his Obey stickers when I was in college in 1992. So he was an icon who was a street artist way back then. So in October of 2008, Ferry and the person who commissioned it, Sir Sergeant, claimed to have printed 3,000 posters and um, a million stickers, as well as clothing and other items with the image. The original source of the photograph, Ferry based on the poster was not publicly known until after Obama won the election. So the timing of this was important. After a mistaken attribution to Reuters photographed by Jim Young for a similar looking photo in 2007, and in 2009, a photographer and blogger, Tom Graylish, discovered that the poster was based actually on an Associated Press photograph by a freelance photographer, Manny Garcia. In 2009, the Associated Press associated um, well, they deemed that the photograph used in the poster is an AP photo and its use requires permission. So the Associated Press protects the people who are generating images. You're supposed to license these images. You're supposed to ask permission for their use. And you'd be surprised. It's really for an astoundingly low amount of money. It really could have been for only $300 that Shepard Ferry could have utilized this image with permission, but yet by choosing to aggressively attack the system itself, stating that it was free use, then the system penalized him for this. And I must say, if Shepard Ferry had been my student, I would have thought he was totally within the artist's right. There are a lot of spurious stories and just sort of legends about what is appropriate or what you can use and have rights to. I honestly thought that if you switched a photograph into silkscreen, that this abstraction was enough that you did not owe somebody something 
for the use of this image. So no matter what we thought it meant in the past or what interpretation you might have of your own, it's really important to know what the court says about these images. So Ferry subsequently filed a federal lawsuit against the Associated Press seeking a declaratory judgment that his use of the AP photograph was protected by fair use and therefore not an infringement on their copyright. However, later it was deduced that this image by looking on a hard drive that he actually knowingly used this other photo and that he attempted to cover it up. When he discovered that he had done this, he told his attorney and tried to put it right. However, the photographer Manny Garcia contended that he retained copyright to the photo and he was proud of the photograph and that very did what he did artistically with it and the effect it had, but that he did not condone people taking things just because they can off the internet. So this is equivalent to there being a store full of images, a store just like a grocery store, and Manny would want to be compensated for his work. He would have to pay for the item on the shelf, yet Shepard took it, even though it was for sale, and said he was allowed. So this was a really big deal. This sets up the context for all of us in the future. So what is fair use? This is a doctrine in the law of the United States that permits limited use of copyrighted material without having to first acquire permission from the copyright holder. Fair use is one of limitations to copyright intended to balance the interests of copyright holders with the public interests and the wider distribution. In the end, uh, what this means is Obama doesn't own the rights to his face. He may have given the right to have Shepard make the image, but Obama doesn't own the photographs of himself. So the rights remain as they exist right now with the phot photographer. And if they are registered, licensed through the Associated Press, they hold the power and they can enforce through law the use. So again, he was penalized because he lied about the source. They settled out of court. In the end, part of his penalty by law was he had 300 hours of community service and paid $30,000. I do believe he was doing very well at this time. So while it, it, I'm sure $30,000 did hurt, he could afford this. So what is an homage? An homage is a special honor or respect shown publicly. And usually if you do an homage, you have to have it in the title or it should be an obvious allusion, an obvious attribution to an extant piece. Here on the left is an original painting by Velasquez. So this is Las Meninas and this is showing the infant queen surrounded by her court her um, dwarfs, her dog. And then on the left, you have Velasquez, who is uh, in a very meta way, painting on the painting that you are seeing. Reflected in the mirror in the background is the king and queen seeing the young princess. So this is an incredibly famous painting located at the Prado, one of the most famous paintings ever in the canon of Western civilization. On the right, you have three interpretations by different artists the one with numbers is Dali. The one in black and white on the lower right is Picasso, who did not one or two or three or four or five interpretations of Las Meninas, but really almost an entire museum's work. Uh, Picasso being rather a machine himself, became so obsessive with processing, comprehending, and I don't know, is it mastication or just reverence? he interpreted the, this painting over and over and over again, fragmenting and reinterpreting stylistically its visual components. And the upper right is Joel Peter Witkin, also creating allusions to Picasso in his work. Another artist who has done homage is Marina Abramovic. Marina Abramovic did nine, I'm sorry, seven easy pieces they were all reappropriated. This was a piece that was shown, I believe, at the Guggenheim. 
and she replicated the work of Vito Acconci herself as a woman instead of a male, masturbating under the floorboards, as well as this piece by Joseph Boyce, which is explaining art to a dead hair. She then covered her face like Boyce in gold leaf and um, attempted to recreate his clothing and use the rabbit. Please note that she had to seek permission to do this, and Marina Abramovic had to get permission from Joseph Boyce's widow in order to recreate this piece, otherwise she would be sued. She needed this so badly, feeling that it was one of the essential, essential pieces that should go into Seven Easy Pieces. She actually went to the home of the widow of Joseph Boyce in order to get this permission. Here's a piece by Walton Ford, a contemporary watercolor artist in the lower right. Here he has lovingly portrayed, I believe they are parakeets, in the style of Benjamin West, uh, this death of a general. So I ask you, can you tell me what painting this is? Obviously it's in Legos, but this is quoting one of the seminal pieces of the 20th century. This is of a man and a woman, a man holding a pitchfork and a woman kind of looking like she has a dental issue. This is Grant Wood, American Gothic. Grant Wood's piece is one of the most parodied images in all of visual history and why. They were very stoic and I don't know, it just sort of cried out to be made fun of. So the imitation, of the style of particular writer, artist, or genre with deliberate exaggeration for the effect of being comedic. So parody, interestingly enough, is copied under copyright, but you have to prove that it is funny, I suppose, and that it is a parody. And that can be thin. Well, before I go on, um, the way it was told to me, uh, my father's family's from Iowa, and they knew the, you know, six degrees of separation, they knew the sister of Grant Wood. So Grant Wood died rather young and his sister inherited the copyright for this painting. And anytime anybody made any allusion to American Gothic, she would sue them. So she was making a pretty good income on challenging other people for the copyright and the image use. So at some point though, I believe the judge said that's enough and limited her, like he cut her off on this ability just to sue anybody who used it, so iconographic. So what is plagiarism? If it's okay to copy things and recontextualize it, or we can pay for the licensure, what is plagiarism? So this is theft. This is the first word that we've really seen that has like a truly negative connotation. So this is to kidnap, seduce, plunder. This is to, um, kidnap like the child or the slave of another. So this is something quite reprehensible. Now, with all of that, I'm not suggesting this is plagiarism, but it could be awfully close. I would still say this is recontextualization. The painting on the left is by Bouguereau. And while I was able to see this piece in person, was prepared to hate it, I was completely blown away by Ron English's ability to really strongly replicate the techniques and uh, virtuoso abilities of the great artist Bouguereau, and then place this face makeup by Kiss on it. I do think this is parody. I do think this is comical. I do think this is commenting. And therefore, Ron English is one of the most masterful artists of the 20, late, latter 20th, early 21st century, uh, who's commenting on culture. However, this is said to be plagiarism. So uh, this is a piece that uh, you can see, and I follow this site, so you might also like to as well. This is Instagram's who's who, and they place art or instances next to each other saying what is original. So it appeared that the piece on the left is Carolyn, Ca Carolina Gomez, and the piece on the right is Matt Lifson. So I believe the original is on the left and the copy is on the right, but don't quote me there. Um, this is just an example from that website. Obviously, it's a picture of a person with a giant gem over it. This is an idea that's not been radically transformed. So this person is ripping off this person's concept. Scholars publicly shame and punish those who are discovered to have lifted works from sources without crediting them 
Originality is prized and imitation is censured. That's from Kendall Busker's book on critique. So there are sites now that are de dedicated to busting people. Uh, for those of you who have utilized images out of National Geographic, I know I have. Here is a piece on the right, and here's the original Geographic on the left. So all of these aggressive uh, images of wolves were utilized on this image on the right. Now, I'm not really positive, but I believe this is a record album. Uh, the message here is, is that if you receive commercial money for a piece, you better be really careful about where the imagery comes from because it's often, uh, like, depending on how popular the band is, you can make pretty good money doing album covers or book jacket covers for major publications. So if money's being exchanged, yes, this photographer, Joel, Sartori could go after this artist, Marcelo Vasco, and say, you know, you owe me some of your money because you used my photographs and they are licensed. This is another album cover, I believe. So uh, on the left, this is Bekshinsky, an amazing, phenomenal Polish artist who has passed away. On the right, this is a really thinly remixed version. So while we see some like more skeletal structures on the right, this is highly derivative and not noticeably transformative. So again, because this person received money for this commission or um, they again licensed this work under the context of being for sale, they owe some debt probably to the state of Bekshinsky. And then there's just derivative. So a derivative artwork is frowned upon both ethically in the art community and in the legal world. Some people argue that if you change 10% or the number varies, um, then it's yours, but the law doesn't see it that way. 10% rule is one of the great myths in the art world. If someone tells you this, don't believe them. To put it plainly, a field guide is not produced so that artists can make derivative works. You know, nobody's going to give you the rules just so you can do this. However, there are books and websites available that are filled with artist reference photos that are copyright free, and you're free to do with those whatever you like. So um, look for copy write free works or free use works and then there's no problem with you using them and there are more and more of these every day so what this is it's about respect for other artists so how would you feel if someone else copied your work and made money off of it you wouldn't feel very good and i would say especially do not copy the work of living artists they're still feeding themselves off of the work that you're using I did cheekily put Campbell's soup cans up here. I'm not even sure if this is an actual Warhol. Warhol did copies of copies of copies of iconic images, and this is called pop art, actually. But if somebody who wasn't Warhol did Campbell's soup cans, then it would be derivative. Um, one of my online friends, Susan Gerber, who is a well-known blogger, has often called out artists who don't steal well. So she says, if you steal, at least steal to improve and not to make a farce out of the fellow artist's work. Left is Marcus Schoenwald of Lavinia. And on the right is Paul Zink. And this is just not very transformative. So you can also see my quote down there, I farce about, but not with living artists. So I went to graduate school, I'm very conscious of uh, what is permissible and what's not. Very early in my career, I probably made mistakes that I'll be drawing attention to shortly. Um, but like all artists do, I think young artists copy, and especially if you're in school, you have kind of a little uh, code of protection there because you're doing things for educational reasons. But once you're out of school or receiving money for something, you should step it up a notch. Here are some more examples that Susan Gerber has identified. So the original, you can tell by the date, is on the bottom. This is Jonathan Viner, Dark Descends, painted in 2005, shown in Jonathan Levine's gallery, 
probably in New York by then in 2006. So it was probably published. It was probably in magazines. It was in the visual lexicon. It was available for staling. And here's a photographer placing a model in a very similar pose, uh, a similar size dress. He's put gloves on her hands. He's got a blue wig on her head. There doesn't seem to be blood or something black dripping down the walls. The soap's in a different place. But does Stephen owe something to Jonathan Viner? Is this sort of like an homage or is this just wholesale ripping off? According to uh, Suzanne, this is derivative. It's plagiarism. So copyright, please note that things over 70 years old and majoritively, not always, but if they're at least 70 years old, they're no longer licensed under copyright unless they renewed the copyright. So here on the right, I have a bunch of collaged things that were from some of the first printed material ever. None of these are under copyright. They're too old. They're from the 19th century. The legal right, uh, copyright is the legal right given to the originator or an assignee to print, publish, perform, film, or record literary, artistic, or musical material. Uh, one of my favorite examples of copyright, and please know as artists, you own your own copyright implicitly. You don't, uh, painters, as far as I know, don't have to register it anywhere. Um, you can register something to be copyright free. For example, if you're on Wikipedia and it's your page, they want a picture, you have to say it's available to put it on Wikipedia. But if you were to sell a painting or commission a painting, someone was to commission a painting of you, you own the copyright. In order to sell the copyright, that's a totally different thing that's outside of either the image of the painting or the painting itself. So if someone wanted to buy the copyright and they were utilizing this on say like a, well, a potentially very successful country Western album, this could be something worth, oh, I don't know, upwards of $10,000 because they would have the right to print it on the you know, magazine covers, uh, album covers, t-shirts, and the licensing of that copyrighted material has value depending on the popularity of the image. For most of us 